Thank you. I, I am going to talk a little bit about uh, projects we've been working on at the Naval Research Laboratory. And uh, although I've given it kind of a long-winded name, uh, in, in more practical terms, uh, we've written a new L&D, uh, which I think will make it easier to add uh, additional or network protocols to Luster. All right, so the idea is that uh, there is now a, another a layer of software between LNET and whatever connection-oriented protocol you'd like to use. Uh, and because a lot of recent work in transport protocols has taken place outside of the kernel, I was, I've tried to eliminate the need for, for, the, for LNET to use uh, protocols that are only within the kernel. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of newer things are, are implemented as a user library that you link against your application. So uh, here's some of the reasons why we got started in this project in the first place. Um, the basic problem we're trying to solve is that uh, you know, our deployed forces collect a lot of data in the field. And whatever they collect, has to be sent to analysts to be examined for intelligence value. And whatever they come up with has to be sent back. Uh, the thing is, the uh, analysts are, are nowhere close to, to where the data is being collected. In fact, every effort is made to keep them here in the US. So right away, you've got a, a problem of just network latency. And in addition to that, the uh, these networks have a tendency to be kind of congested, and congestion leads to packet loss. Now, if you're fortunate enough to have a terrestrial network to get you all the way from theater back to the analysts, then the latencies you're looking at are usually somewhere in the neighborhood of about 100 milliseconds round trip. And uh, whenever I refer to latencies, I, I generally do this in round trip times just because I'm kind of a networking person. Uh, but the thing is, you, in most cases, uh, you will not be lucky enough to have a terrestrial network the whole way. And oftentimes, there's a satellite somewhere in the path. Um, a satellite, or a single satellite, will add in the neighborhood of about 240 milliseconds to your round trip time, which is pretty significant. And I say add because there's still some terrestrial network in, in the path as well. So now that we've added another 240 milliseconds, we've also restricted the bandwidth even further. Uh, this is actually not a very friendly environment for reliable protocols, uh, if for no other reason than the time that it takes to recover from a lost packet. So we think there are probably two good ways to go about tackling this problem. One is to pick a transport protocol that uh, is well suited to this kind of environment and will make the most efficient use possible of the bandwidth available. Uh, the other approach would be to try uh, limiting the amount of data that needs to be sent. And that's a little trickier. But to this end, uh, we think that adding a file system into the into this scenario might be of some value. So currently, you know, whatever data is collected, it all gets sent back wholesale. But if there's a file system available, then it should give the analyst an opportunity to kind of sift through the data uh, before, you know, before copying any of it. So for example, if you have a bunch of files, they can look through the files that are available. They can read the headers out of them and kind of pick and choose which files uh, contain data that are of interest to them. Uh, another good example is if you take the case of a file that contains video data. Uh, with a file system, you've got the ability to seek with a particular file. So now they can, for example, read a few frames, skip ahead so many frames, read a few more, and they don't actually have to move the entire contents to get something valuable out of it. Uh, that alone actually might be a compelling enough reason to, uh, to add a file system into this environment. So I've mentioned that uh, a lot of recent to protocol development has happened outside of the kernel. Uh, 
In fact, the protocol we had in mind is one such example. Uh, we've been toying with the idea of using UDT uh, for these kinds of networks. And we have some experience with it, and it's all been fairly positive. Uh, the, some of the uh, reasons I think that it is well suited to this environment I've, I've listed here. Uh, first being that it uses an explicit negative acknowledgement. So in UDT, uh, there are no duplicate acknowledgements. As soon as the recipient notices that there's something missing from the sequence numbers, they can report back immediately that uh, to the sender that these things are missing. And this reduces the amount of time to recover from lost data. Um, what might be even more important is the congestion avoidance mechanism. So it's, it's not really a new idea, but uh, UDT does periodically uh, send two of your data packets back to back. In other words, it'll send them as fast as the network interface will carry them. And they're marked so that when the recipient gets them, it knows to measure the time between these packets, and in, in so doing, it can figure out how fast they arrived. Uh, so it reports this information back to the sender, and for the next period, uh, the sender can shape its traffic to that rate. And doing that will mostly avoid uh, congestion in the, or will avoid overfilling queues and network elements along the way and mostly avoids congestion. All right, so now that we've got some way to avoid congestion, uh, the window size, what we would normally call the congestion window, can be almost entirely determined by the round trip time, which gets measured. And so by doing this, uh, there's, there should always be enough data available to keep the pipe full. Now I said it's almost entirely determined by round trip time. Uh, if there is packet loss, uh, the window does get uh, decreased ever so slightly. And this is important because it prevents retransmitted packets from themselves causing congestion and maintains stability in the algorithm. Um, I've pointed out here that UDT allows you to provide your own congestion control algorithm. I, we haven't done that. I find the one that comes with it to be suitable. But if you choose to provide your own, it is a simple matter of implementing a, a few methods in a class, and you can override the ones that come with it. So despite the fact that we can use transport protocols that are outside of the kernel, of course, LND requires that some portion of it still be in the kernel. Um, although we've tried to offload the bulk of the work to the uh, daemon process. Um, connection management, of course, and all the transport functions are handled outside of the kernel in this case. But now that we've split the implementation, uh, we have to have some way of passing control and, and data back and forth between the two halves. And so we've chosen to use a, a character device, and that lets us do some really simple things like select an ioctal. With a little additional work, uh, we can avoid copying message contents between the two halves. So we can memory map whatever pages are provided by LNET uh, into the, the daemon's address space. So this is a quick overview, and really what you can see from this is that there is actually some overlap in bookkeeping duties. Uh, I think it's probably unavoidable, uh, but the kernel, all, in addition to the daemon, also has to keep track of peers that are available and outstanding messages. Uh, but still, the, the heavy lifting is still done by the daemon process, uh, and I should have included the uh, transport functions on there. All right, so one uh, possibly unusual aspect of the connection management here is that any one transport connection is expected to carry file system data in only one direction. And this really grew out of a, a quirk in UDT where uh, we were having some re reliability issues uh, carrying data for long periods of time bidirectionally on the same connection. So it actually affected the design of our LND. Uh, so when the uh, LN or when the daemon process actually does have a connection to make, 
takes the same approach as, as some of the other LNDs and extracts an, an IP address from the NID. Um, so the IP address, of course, is provided uh, to the LNET kernel module and the network's parameter, just like always. But the interface that you provide there is not guaranteed to carry all of the traffic sourced by this LND. Uh, the daemon process does not bind to a particular interface for outbound connections. So this means that whatever routes you have installed and whatever routing policy you have in your system uh, will actually determine the outbound interface and therefore the source IP address on those packets. So there's actually a chance that if you have a multi-home host, you have some uh, asymmetric movement of data amongst the network interfaces. I've pointed out that a uh, little additional bookkeeping is required in the daemon uh, where luster routing is in involved. Uh, so we keep track of you know, what peer is on the end of every connection. And if we get a message from a source NID that is not that peer, uh, then of course that message has been routed. We keep track of that so that whenever we have return traffic, uh, it's still the same simple destination did look up for the outbound messages. All right, so I don't want to spend too much time on the next two slides, but I think they do give a good overview of, of what's happening under the hood. So uh, at the top of this diagram, uh, the daemon process is actually waiting around in select, although well, I don't show it. So whenever, whenever LNET has a, a message to be sent, it provides it to the kernel half of our LND, and it wakes up the uh, daemon process through a poll function. And when that happens, the daemon checks to see if the file descriptor is readable or writable. And in this case, it's writable, so it knows to call the transmit notify ioctl and gets some information about the message to send. And after it's done this, it can memory map the contents of the message. Once that's done, of course, you can, send, you can call the uh, transport protocol send function, and when the receiver has acknowledged receipt of the message, we can tell the kernel we're done through another ioctl and then unmap the buffers. Uh, the receive case is slightly more involved. So again, we're waiting around in, in a select. But this time, something arrives from the network instead of the kernel waking it up. And so the first thing we do is to call the transport function or transport protocols receive function and we only read enough data to get the LNET header. And after we've got it, we can call the receive start ioctl and provide that header to the kernel half who passes it along to LNET. And at some later time, LNET will come back with buffers for this message to be received into. And from this point on, it's actually very similar to the transmit case. Uh, we receive the data directly into the buffers, tell the kernel we're done, and then unmap them. All right, so the, um, I've been talking about everything in terms of UDT so far. It's not actually necessary to use that protocol if you, if you didn't want to. Uh, so we've, we've provided an API that will, uh, without too much effort, allow you to tack on other protocols. And the API kind of assumes that the protocols are connection oriented. So if they aren't, it's only a, a little bit of extra work to make them look that way. Uh, but the, uh, the API has mostly has functions that, that look a lot like uh, their sockets counterparts. Uh, so much so that the, uh, the function prototypes are, are identical for a lot of them. And if you're using a protocol that has a sockets implementation, you can just provide the, you can provide pointers to things like you know, connect and listen, send and receive. And we'll call those directly. Um, all, you know, currently, it's necessary for all the peers in your network to use the same protocol because I haven't provided any way to negotiate that protocol. Um, so whenever you start Luster, uh, you'll have to tell it which one to use and all the peers will have to agree on it. Uh, and ju just to make the point, um, I 
put together a small uh, protocol backend that uses the Oracle RDS protocol, and it is not connection oriented, and it does actually use the uh, have a sockets interface. All right, so here's kind of where things stand now. Uh, we've got things working in a rather controlled environment. So it's working at the lab. Um, we're confident enough that we're willing to demonstrate it. And we've shown it with uh, round trip times between the client and the servers with uh, up to 200 milliseconds. I've actually tested it up to 400 milliseconds and it seems to work okay. I kind of the one sticky point here is that uh, I don't yet have permission to hand out the source code. That's something we're working on. I, I'm guessing that within another month or so, uh, that'll be resolved. All right, and here's where I think I'd like to go next. Uh, all of my testing so far really has been, uh, has really concentrated on validating correct behavior. And so I, I think we really should focus next on some performance testing and also make it a little bit easier to use. Uh, you can imagine that with the implementation split between the kernel and user space, uh, some of the startup can be a, a little bit manual. All right, I, I've also listed a few things here that um, I think might be fun to do and probably not a whole lot of effort. Uh, but that's where things stand and uh, that's all I've got. Are there any questions? As I see in all news diagrams, you don't see, don't use a ring buffers for messages from and to networks. It is uh, have a special reasons, or this is because uh, this implementation is prototype. I'm sorry. Be because uh, you sh will be remove a, a map and unmap calls. If in case you will be use a ring buffer. Okay, I'm not sure I quite follow. Uh, yeah, there are I mean, there is some overhead associated with the uh, the map and unmap. That's certainly true. Yes, but you can create some preallocated <coughs> ring buffer with and some area to put and get data from and to networks network exchange. In other words, so you will be have a single call for m mapping this data to kernel space and removing from mapping. So just in set up and clean up code. <coughs> this is just a performance question because uh, in current diagrams you will be mm -hmm. need two additional syscalls for each packets. But uh, if you create a ring buffer, you will be remove this. Ah. Okay, yes, yeah. so there certainly are some optimizations that could be made. And absolutely, for, for small messages especially, uh, it may, if they're small enough, it might actually be more efficient simply to copy them through a, a, a read or write kind of system call instead of doing the, the mapping. I agree. Uh, for the use cases that we had in mind, uh, we tend to have a lot of large messages and I think that the uh, the overhead is is at least for the way we're using it justified but that is a good point um, so have you have you effectively moved the worker thread pool to user space well there is a, a worker thread pool in user space yeah, yeah. but I mean many LNDs are structured that there's that there's a worker thread tool worker thread pool that you know does the shoveling in a, right a, yeah so the um, and so the kernel half of this implementation is is depressingly single threaded. Right. Ah, okay. Yeah. By the way, um, Shadow, the, the the buffer addresses are determined by whoever's using LNet. So you couldn't the only reason you could use a ring buffer is for to if you use a ring buffer you are forced to copy. So it's like uh, like was said, um, yeah, that would be an optimization for small messages. Is the goal here to have a really sorry? Uh, is the goal here to have a really uh, high? Uh, sorry, over here. 
there you go. Talk. Um, have a uh, high a high bandwidth connection here, or is it just and just have a high bandwidth, high latency, high latency connection, or is it really for kind of these intermittent slash slow connections? Ah, um, well, the thing that I mean, the reason we got started on it was because we have high latency, moderate bandwidth connections. Um, so more, more it was to deal with the uh, the combination of latency and loss. Uh, there's so the, uh, the UDT protocol itself was actually designed to handle uh, high bandwidth delay product networks in general. And so, you know, large latencies and high bandwidth. So you I, are expecting to get some good performance out of this, then? I'm hoping I'm expecting to get better performance than we do now. So first off, thanks for doing this work. Uh, you, you saved me some, uh, some real problems. I've got a couple of protocols I want to work on that don't have KLNDs yet. I could only do them from user space. But the, uh, the, the main question I want to ask is, when the time comes and you're able to secure permission to release this, um, how do the rest of us find out about that? Do you have plans on where you might announce it? Oh, um, I suppose I can, I guess the appropriate place would be to send email to the HPDD discuss list or something. Is that, is that suitable? Okay, done. Okay. Eric Kinsey, thank you very much.